The summer of 1978, Larry Cuba came and did a talk at the University of Michigan about how the trench run uh, computer graphics were done on Star Wars. And uh, that was my first real exposure to computer graphics. Uh, I was interested in computer graphics. It wasn't something I pursued until uh, I came to ILM. Uh, I was hired as a motion control camera assistant. And so I was a camera operator for a number of years um, at ILM before I moved over into the computer graphics department on the BIS. Are you okay to say that TV's pop culture sense entirely on two of your achievements? Photoshop and hence some of the effects of Howard the Duck, the royal removal software? Early on in my uh, tenure at ILM, um, I went over to the computer graphics department and got a tour of the tools that they had and, and what they were working on. And um, during the visit, I saw them working on uh, the first digital wire removal that was on Howard the Duck. And I remember being very impressed with the technology there that I thought, uh, that's pretty remarkable what they're doing. And, uh, these kind of tools are likely to, to be a big part of our future. I've always been curious about what seems to be an early morph in a movie called uh, The Golden Child in 1986. Mm. It was more like a, a warping yeah. from the rat to the actor. Yeah. Could this be considered as a, a test for Willow's morph, actually? Mm. I don't know. I mean, I did that as a slit scan. Oh. So that was a slit scan on an animation stand. Um, very different than how morphing is done. Uh, the only real relation is just uh, you know, the idea of warping imagery. I am first year the cyberware on uh, Star Trek IV, mm -hmm. uh, time travel. Uh, was it the same as in the Abyss, or was it modified and uh, implemented in a different fashion in the, the Abyss? Uh, it was the same scanner. I was not working in the computer graphics department during Star Trek IV. I did work on the film, but uh, in the animation department on a motion control animation stand. On the Abyss, one of the cyberware digitizers had been purchased by uh, Walt Disney Imagineering. So we arranged to have the actors come to Imagineering and we scanned them on the cyberware digitizer. But it's the same uh, piece of hardware that uh, was used for Star Trek IV. Uh, on Star Trek, that was, uh, they were all static poses, single scan. Um, we had to do two things with this. I needed to get enough different expressions scanned that we could animate between them to have them appear to be alive and doing their performances. We also had to take the result of that animation and fuse it onto the end of the tentacle. You were responsible for the design of the pseudopod. Uh, I think the design came from the mind of uh, Jim Cameron yeah. and it had been storyboarded uh, and drawn out. Uh, so the basic forms, uh, what the expectation of what it would look like was represented in those drawings. Mm -hmm. uh, my title on the film was Computer Graphics Designer, mm -hmm. but that is mostly due to uh, uh, this being a, a very early computer graphics project and there not really being a standardization to what you called the roles. Yeah, but I understand you wanted to, to have some a ripple effect on the tentacle, like a perpetual uh, a ripple effect. Mm -hmm. what, how was it achieved back in the day? We had a procedural wave generator. What you would do is define a number of points in space, and each one of them would output a three-dimensional sine wave, you know, rippled in 3D from that point. And then uh, on any point on the surface, you would sum the, uh, the weights of all of those and they would add up um, constructively and destructively to, to have some complexity and displace the surface out at that point. You worked with Jim Cameron uh, on two films? Yes. On this and uh, Avatar. How would you say his vision evolved from 1989 to 2009 and nowadays? Uh, it was the same Jim Cameron I, I knew on The Abyss. He is... Um, a really smart guy. He's in a lot of ways an ideal client in that what you're looking for in, in a client is someone who has good taste, who has a clear vision of what it is that they want, that they're able to describe that vision clearly and are consistent about it. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought all of those were true with Jim. Um, I, I got along with him very well. He's tough. He expects you to really bring your A game, but uh, you know, I think uh, that's what everyone expects of ILM. I've read that you took some pictures 
of the whole set and made a cube map back in yeah. the late 80s and tried to replicate the sources of the lights. Was it difficult to do? Like many things on, um, on the Abyss, we were doing them kind of for the first time. So there wasn't a lot of established procedure for how these things happen. I knew from discussion with the other folks in the computer graphics department that uh, the way we would make a reflective object is um, you need to pass uh, the, the renderer uh, this cube map that represents uh, you know, the six faces of a cube um, of the environment. So uh, I brought a still camera with me on the shoot and when we were shooting I would uh, photograph the set and of course uh, like any movie set it is not lit for all directions at once you know when we're shooting this direction it's lit for that and then over on this side there's lighting equipment and crew members and everything so i would shoot the part that was lit and i would wait for when we did the reverses and we turned around and all the equipment's on this side now we're lit for this direction i would photograph that side of the set and i tried to make sure i, I got everything um, and then when I got back, um, and I was already in development on Photoshop with my brother, and uh, I used Photoshop to take all those images that I'd photographed and kind of assemble them into those cube maps. Mm -hmm. Moving on to Mission Impossible, mm -hmm. uh, apart from the fact that uh, TGVs do use uh, lines to get electricity from them, yeah. so that's something that's always on my mind when I watch the movie, the sequence nowadays is still uh, Impressive. I understand that it was quite difficult with models, CG, um, terrain replicated in the in the back. So um, how was it done? I understand it was something that was shot fairly early in the movie development. Yeah, I mean uh, the first thing that uh, I worked on was uh, aerial plate shooting. It's supposed to be France, but it's not. It's uh, we shot all that in Scotland. So the first thing was shooting all those plates. And then we went through and made, uh, made selects for all of those and tried to cut them together into something that, uh, that kind of made uh, geographic sense. There are, of course, no um, real trains in the movie in wide views where you see the train that's uh, computer generated. There's no helicopters in the movie. Whenever you see the helicopter flying, that's also computer generated. Um, we had set fragments. So there was a, uh, a section of the first two cars of the train that was built on uh, the 007 stage at Pinewood Studios. We shot in front of a blue screen. To get that uh, wind effect on uh, Tom Cruise, he was very excited and we wanted a uh, very strong wind that you, you know, when a vehicle is traveling that kind of speed. That was done with a stationary parachuting fan. So I don't know if you've seen those fans uh, where you know you can sort of hover over over that. So that's what that was. The the fan was outside the stage, and there was a large two meter pipe duct that came into the stage, and would be directed to blow across him. And when that thing was going, and it was 150 mile an hour wind, and really couldn't stand up in that um, because it would just blow you over. So um, it, the effect was really. Uh, very convincing. You see yeah. the skin moving on his face. It was great. And that uh, same year, you also worked on the Star Trek. Yes. Your fourth credit on the Star Trek, actually, with, uh, with uh, the TV series, the two TV series you worked on, and uh, the first generation with the battle, uh, like uh, yeah. crashing on the ship. Mm -hmm. And on um, first contact, there was a sequence that was supposed to be done in one take that you had worked so oh, hard yeah. to do in one take, and yeah. in the end. Was uh, cut to see uh, Data's re um, reaction. Yeah. Uh, th that uh, is still impressive today. <laughs> I was, well, yeah, I was a little disappointed they cut it apart. Because the way it was uh, storyboarded and planned, the uh, point of that shot was they wanted it all to be you know, this one seamless thing. It's the Borg Queen's uh, first shot where she's uh, coming down from the ceiling and uh, she's just the head and shoulders and the spinal column and then. She lowers down and fits into her body and then walks forward. Um, she's delivering dialogue the entire time, so um, it was um, important that the rig that we shot this with had to be silent because uh, you want to be able to record dialogue. I wanted to shoot this as two separate, pa in fact, three passes. We shot her on a crane lowering down. We shot uh, her already kind of in her suit 
uh, walking forward and we sort of matched positions there. And then we also shot uh, clean with nobody there so that we could uh, paint out the crane and other things um, to have the background. We shot it with a motion control system uh, to be able to repeat those moves. And motion control systems are often uh, fairly loud, you know, they're not silent. Mm -hmm. Uh, but because we were recording dialogue, uh, I had them retrofit uh, the whole system with uh, servo motor so it would be completely silent. And then we photographed this on VistaVision, this you know, large format film, and the VistaVision cameras were not uh, uh, quiet either, so we used a blimped uh, VistaVision camera so that was silent. So we went to all this trouble to, to, to get that, and apparently nobody told the special effects department uh, that rigged the crane that uh, she was on for it to be silent because that was the noisiest thing on the set. And of course, because it was so noisy, they had to just uh, loop all her dialogue later. So we did our job. <laughs> Again, moving on to Star Wars, episode one. I ended a lot of um, uh, CG characters until that point. Uh, before that, there was Casper and uh, Draco from Dragonheart. Mm -hmm. So I understand that you raised the bar for it uh, hi, for Jar Jar to be made at the time, 1997, something like that? Uh, well, we started, yeah, we shot it in 1997. Yeah, I mean, that was a, a big challenging project. Uh, it was the biggest uh, visual effects production that had ever been done. Mm. You know, I was used to a situation where um, almost every project we worked on, there was some new ground that was being explored, some new piece of technology to be developed to, to do some imagery. but. When I was first uh, exposed to what we had ahead of us on episode one, it was um, seeing 3,600 storyboards. It was the whole film drawn out uh, and George Lucas taking us through the story on all of that. Boy, almost uh, every few boards, there was something else there that we had no way of doing with our current tool set. So I'm sort of taking note of all of the areas that uh, were going to require uh, some work with R&D and new software to, to be able to accomplish. It was a little overwhelming just uh, you know, how many areas we were going to have to uh, really push the boundaries on. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, that it was had to be done in, in very large quantity. Mm -hmm. Final question. Mm -hmm. There's like a quest for the perfect uh, digital character, the perfect human, and mm -hmm. uh, it's supposed to be um, the holy grail of computer graphics, I don't know if you do agree with that. Is it the holy I don't know, yeah. it's a challenge. Challenge, yeah. In Rogue One, to make uh, Tarkin live again, mm -hmm. it's very difficult, but would you say that when we get to the point that we can do a perfect CG human, mm -hmm. people will notice that it is still CG, or won't they notice? Well, isn't the uh, premise of your question that uh, it's the perfect... Uh, yeah, but... Well, then you wouldn't notice, would you? Yeah. But the thing that um, made me disbelief it was there was the <laughs> fact that in the original movie it was not blinking, never blinking. And in Rogue One it was like blinking every two minutes. That's what took me out of the character. But I don't know if you made that um, intentionally. Well, yeah. the performance was being driven by an actor. Yeah. So uh, that actor made a number of acting choices. He was not trying to do uh, an impression of Peter Cushing. He was trying to do a similar character, you know, in that uh, he was a very uh, sort of proper mannered uh, officer with a bit of a, a ruthless bent to him. He said he wasn't going to try and do an impression. So what we were doing with that was recreating a character that was well known to audiences in the past and um, that we use computer graphics to do it uh, is conceptually not that different from um, how historical figures have been done in other films and in many cases some effort is made to improve the likeness to make that actor look more like the character they're playing and sometimes that is done um, just with a little bit of makeup and sometimes it's done with very extensive prosthetics and in this case we use computer graphics but conceptually it's no different.